Roundtable Podcast. I'm your boy, Corey G. At Small Arms Danny. At Trace Speed in the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. <laughs> we are here live at the Arnold. The yes, Max sir. Ever Muscle Boots. Shout out Sam Adams. Yeah, shout out. Up. He had yeah. to stand up for that. Yeah, yeah. motherfucker, what <laughs> up? Shout out to new pre-extreme. Yeah, yeah pre-extreme. Yeah, pre-extreme. Yeah. All right, we got an old homie on today. Joshua Shaw, I worked with him over at MP back in the days when he's a young cat. Industry, uh, listen, dude, you're just like one of them people that people are paying attention to in the industry in general now. For your, your You've been consulting. You've been giving your takes on stuff. I, I always laugh because when I'm consuming your content, I remember like back in the day when you was a kid and I'm seeing like how much your growth has been and I catch myself and I'm like, I just learned a shitload off Josh. I'm fucking like, I I just really want to show love, man, because you've come a long way and it's exciting to have you on the show now as a 38 year old, which we just talked about. And I'm excited for these guys to be able to ask questions about the industry, get your take on the industry. And, you know, maybe talk about some old type of shit, too. So, yeah. welcome to the show, no, Josh I, pre- Shaw. I appreciate it. You, Ohio I, guy, too, yeah, baby. Ohio <laughs> guy, yeah. I feel good being in the Arnold. Anytime I step foot in Ohio, I feel really good. But uh, I appreciate all the great things you said. I mean, I, I feel like you play it back. I know we've said this before, but, like, you play it back. I feel like I've been saying the same shit for, like, 12 years. And I think that's part <laughs> of, like, this whole thing is, like, I haven't changed. I mean, I've gotten, obviously, levels and, and kind of improved and saw much more, like, patterns and sequences in the industry, saw a lot of successful businesses, been a part of a lot of successful businesses. But um, a lot of that kind of stuff, I feel like I've been barking the same shit for yeah. 12 years. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? But now it's, like, the timing, and I have, I've had to work on that over time, the timing and the delivery of everything. Now things are starting to actually, like, you know, work out. So. Yeah, it's good. One of the things I want to talk about first is because I – Danny worked with me at MP – but these other guys were more like consumers, yeah. right? And it's like, because Cole tweeted me when he was 15 yeah, on how so, to take creatine. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, exactly, yeah exactly. <laughs> Trey, I went and worked out at this high school gym with the, with the homies. Yeah. Like, they were every, these guys were, you know, watching what was going on. But, like, if you can summarize, you, I've heard you say MP was lightning in a bottle. But I try to explain the chaos of the growth to them the best I can. And Danny kind of remembers, but it's like, how do you – like, how do you, like, reflect on that and talk about, like, what you saw us <laughs> doing slash chaos that we, we were growing four times the amount every year? Yeah, I feel like a lot of it was, like, I mean, it was definitely male dominant in, in general. Like, there was a lot of testosterone. A lot of people had, like, opinions. They had a, a drive. They had a vision. They had this, like, idea of, like, what they wanted. There was also momentum that was just would kind of consume the whole like space like you just were in this energy that was like going and it was tough to like stop and breathe you just felt like you had to keep going and going and going and going and like i mean i remember working 80 100 hour weeks like every single week i was in there with with uh pyatt and stuff like on saturday on sunday i was there every single day i was trying to like put my hand in everything and that was like you know one of the things to uh, anybody that i always tell that's like getting into any space is like you need to be like a student in the game. You need to be like fully invested into everything and trying to learn everything you can. Because like I was saying, I was, I was a couple years out of my, my MBA education, but that was my real world MBA. That was like my, <laughs> Oh yeah, my, it was real world. world. Right? So, like, I got to see like some crazy ass. Like I always say like, it's going to be a case study eventually. Like people oh, are going to yeah. play this back and say like, maybe there was some great things we did. There were some things that we didn't do as well. For sure. But at the end of the day, like that was such a learning experience. It was such a, like a, like a gravitational pull it had. Like It was a learning like, experience for like, everybody, Josh. Like every, <laughs> but that was the thing. Like, you know, we're talking like I was in my mid-20s. You guys were just in like Third, your, early, your 30s. early 30s. Like, I mean, nobody in that organization was old enough to be like this gray-haired old head that was like, oh, these are the things you guys got to watch out for. No we one had ran like, a seven-figure business before. I was a personal yeah. trainer two years before it. We were just sitting there and going like, shit like we got to hang on for dear life like yeah. everybody wants our shit how do we make more how do we keep it in stock how do we get the hottest uh you know athletes how do we get the hottest like sponsorships it didn't matter like we were just trying to like grab and grab and grab and grab and it was like it absorbed you like you felt yeah. like i mean people talk about like drinking the kool-aid like it wasn't hard to drink the kool-aid because you literally were like swimming in it it yeah. was there it was all yeah, there swim- you know <laughs> it sounds yeah. about right so <laughs> i'm gonna go back to the entry point because so first off I would have been, I think I was like a sophomore in high school, and I tweeted G about this. So this is at the Muscle Farm so Hype. And now, you know, he goes on, starts, uh, leaves MP, starts to max over muscle. I was now in your spot where I was, I was actually in school learning about the brand and stuff like that, and I was just fulfilling orders. So what was, like, your first entry point? Because I think that's, like, the biggest key is, like, 
getting into something, like what were you doing? Yeah, so I started out in the supplement industry actually like well before uh, Muscle Farm. I was just in college and undergrad. A bunch of my buddies were getting into fitness and bodybuilding. I wasn't really into like the competing side, but I was appreciative of like supplements and all the stuff that was going on and I wanted to learn more. So I got on bodybuilding.com during like the days of like the forums. Yep. This mm-hmm. is before like predating a lot of like the social media stuff. And because I was like interacting with business owners and all that kind of stuff like that, I started to get involved with it. And, and a company was nice enough to be like, hey, we'd love to hire you and kind of have you send, send you out to do like market trips in like Chicago or New York or Philadelphia, where I would basically play Santa Claus, where I would have a bunch of samples. I'd go to like GNCs or vitamin shops yeah. that they had their products in and just give them a bunch of stuff. And that's how I initially kind of got started in, in, in the space. And then when I graduated, I kind of went off and did something else. I just yeah. didn't see like how I could fit and add value um, to what I wanted to do. And it was like an actual prior connection with that time. I met one of the co-founders of Bodyman.com at like a, I think the Olympia. And like we had got along or whatever. And when he jumped on at Muscle Farm, he was like, hey, we're looking for like a couple different people. We're looking for some salespeople. We're looking for like a kind of a jack of all trades. I think you'd be good at that. And I said, okay. You so know, what, Jeremy's the one who brought you on? Yeah, that was originally uh, like, okay. it was it was kind of a little bit of interest because I actually reached out directly to Leonard first yeah, yeah, I because Leonard. I was like, wanted to see what was going on with this, this, this company because I kept seeing it pop up more. And this was before the big lime green MP. This was like when it was like, I call Chains it the, and yeah, the, the fucking Ed Hardy, <laughs> like kind of yeah. like, uh, you know, like old school goth yeah. kind of look to it. So I was just interested in what they were doing because I liked the, like the athlete approach. I like how they were taking a different angle. And I approached kind of out of the blue, and then it just so happened that, you know, the connections, serendipitous moments happened or whatever, and I, and I jumped. Uh, I was living in Nevada at the time. I'd never been to Denver. They flew me in. There was, like, a bunch of, like, like UFC fighters and things that were, like, going when I was doing my interviews. And I was asking kind of, like, as a wide-eyed, big, uh, young kid, I was like, is this, like, was the all rampage, the time? Was the Rampage camp going on whenever you came um, in? This was, like, I think before that, but I think okay. they were, there were some people in there. And Got I was it. like, is this happening, like – all the time and like <laughs> dead face there's like yeah this is how it is and like i'm like i'm in i'm yeah. in this is how it's gonna be all the time now that wasn't the reality of it like all the time but it, it totally sucked me in but it yeah. was really i started with being on these like internet forms and really like doing early internet customer service like making nothing basically and uh, i just thought hey this is cool this is a passion i love it i'm just gonna keep giving them everything i can they progressed me over time but when i left school I just I had an accounting and, and finance and, and I was like I'm gonna go do what I actually was going to, you know, think I was gonna go do and, and um, it, it brought me back. You know what I mean? And now yeah. I've been there for the last you know 12 years. Hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean I'm just thinking about it from the outside sales rep, you know, perspective because I was in Chicago, but I could still feel the. Uh, it almost felt like you we were like invincible at a certain point. Like it was like a, but also a runaway train. Yeah. Um, that, that <laughs> yeah, we, that, that sounds about right. We couldn't really ever stop. <laughs> yeah. Like it, ne- it just felt like we couldn't fail. Yeah. Like, there was so much shit always going on in different parts of the country and everything. So, like, knowing, I mean, looking back in retrospect now, what are, like, one to three things that you would do first to stop that train or to maybe reel it back in a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what you just kind of mentioned about just always – we were always launching things. We were Like, we were never taking time – to actually cultivate what we were, like some of those successful things. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, mo- uh, combat and assault were like, bar none, cr- they crushed it. You know what yep. I mean? These could have been in their cells, hundred million dollar hero skews. We could have built out all these different kind of formats with that, but we were so focused on what else can we launch? What else can we launch? What else can we launch? That, yeah, what those else th- can we sign? Who yeah, else can we sign? They were, they were uh, <laughs> continuing to grow, but we were, kind of spread so thin, you know what I mean, from a sales perspective, from a marketing perspective, from whatever, like, we were never focused. It was always like, grab more, grab more, grab more, the grab more. The problem is because it kept working. Yeah. So it, you uh, think uh, like, oh, if I get more people, I sign Tiger. Like, we didn't even have a strategy when we signed Tiger. Like, like we didn't have a skew. Object. We yeah. didn't have a skew to go into, like, golf shops. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you, if you s- spend money like that, yeah, it's cool. I got to go hang out with Tiger. Yeah. But yeah. the reality is, like, we should have had something that immediately could have went to the trade show for golf to get, yeah. you know what I mean? You Stuff remember, that's a great uh, example. You remember Muscle Gel? Yeah, exactly. That was like, I was thinking yeah. that. I mean, Muscle we could gel never was amazing. Get, we could never get the um, contract manufacturing to be right. Yeah. That was the problem on that thing. That yeah. was so ahead of the time. We talk about. Because it was collagen. So you think collagen now, billion-dollar category. I mean, we were doing it. Insane. Yeah. You know, back 
12 years ago when like people were talking trash about college and we were telling him about like, hey, yeah. you know, joint. This was great. It was portable. Busy and this like it was shout great. Out. <laughs> yeah, shout out to shout Busy out Busy Diet. Diet. Yeah. Shout out oversized. So I got for, I yeah. got the uh, so I got that product from an MLM company I used to work for. Yeah. And then I, I brought it to Brad and I was like, look, I was like, there ain't fucking anything like this out here. But it was so early. Oh, people so early. Did, people yeah. didn't understand. Yeah. It. Being early is, is also being wrong. You know. Yeah. What I mean? yeah, I've, yeah. I've learned that a lot over time. Is like it's great to try to be like forward leaning, but yeah, if you're too early, you're actually wrong. You know. Yeah. What I mean, it's like you you just can't help people, but. You know, other than that, I think that, like, kind of what Corey said, I mean, we were we were just grabbing so much in every single thing. There was not one day that I think we all just stopped and breathed, I think, and that was part of the problem was, and, it, and we had a small team, so there were so many people doing so many different things that, you know, we talk about, you know, organizational structure, just things that were, like, segregation of duties and, and stuff that, like, I was trying to preach at the time, and they're like, you're trying to corporatize our business, get out of here, kid, you know, whatever, and I was like, guys, like, <laughs> like people are just like they're touching money they're approving money they're doing i'm like what's going on here whatever and i'm like okay you know like fast hey, and furious hey, hey i'm just gonna keep yeah. keep my head down i'm gonna work hard or whatever you know like i'm gonna throw some ideas out there but there was just a lot of those things that you play it back and you realize but at the time i mean as as much as if i pointed them out or not i also pointed them out but then still did the other things that were like that we were doing wrong i mean i was like all fully invested into the vision i knew that you know, we were going after this big, ambitious dream, and I knew that we were going to achieve it if we just all kept our, you know, kind of nose to the grind. We stuck to what leadership was kind of saying, and, and we kind of went with that vision, regardless of if I had, you know, other ideas or not. And, I, you know, I was that brash kid that had all these kind of big ideas, and nobody wanted to listen to me. Like, I threw them out there, but I, at the time, I, I don't think I knew how to either, one, communicate them to be properly, like, actually absorbed by the people that, that needed sure. to be absorbed. And then secondly, I also didn't understand how to, like, you know, continuously talk about them in a way that, like, provided logic and value so people knew. It was kind of like, here's an idea. Oh, you don't get it? Okay, I'll just move on to the next thing. I didn't really understand, like, yeah. you know, now as a little bit of an older, more wise person, like, now that when I'm working with entrepreneurs, a lot of it's the psychology of the entrepreneur. It's and, how you deliver it sometimes, Yeah, bro. it's all about that. I mean, the X's and O's of business, everybody needs to have those fundamentals, mm -hmm. but that's not what separates at least a, a good entrepreneur or even somebody like me that's providing services. Like I have to understand, you know, what's their deepest desires, what, you know, what things that they, um, you know, hate, love, whatever. And also within the organization, the culture, like are there, is there family dynamics? Is there, you know, is there this guy that's dating this person? What, you have to understand that because especially when I'm coming up with like these strategic plans, I could give it to somebody and then all of a sudden when they start to implement it, I didn't look into all these other kind of Factors, you know, yeah. messy yeah. things. Yeah. It, it just it wrecks it every time. It wrecks it every time. And it's unfortunate because it's like, here's this beautiful thing, and then it goes to, goes to shit. But it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where over time I've learned that that part is way more important. That's the stuff that I work off right off the bat with entrepreneurs is like, let me get into your mindset. Let me understand how you operate in your head first before I start to then put things in play in your business. Because until I understand that, whatever else I do after that is not going to be as effective as it can be. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like, when you start working with businesses, do you have, like, kind of, like, a foundation or a strategy that you always start with, like, you know, kind of, like, identify what's the common problem in all these, like, businesses and stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's, so there are usually, like, buckets of problems that is usually universal. And then within that, there are, you know, X's and O's kind of fundamentals that have yeah. been proven to work for decades, if not what, centuries. What would, you, yeah, what would you say is, but, like, probably, like, the most common thing that you see that people, like, definitely struggle with that, like, they're maybe just not aware of or something. You know, I think it's a lot of like the integrated thinking in the sense of that they don't understand how, you know, product works with sales channels, work with margins, work with, you know, there's there's all these things where they go, oh, well, I have a great product. Well, everybody has a great product, you know. <laughs> so what else, what are you doing with that great product? Where do you want to sell it? How much money do you make on it? You know, how are you marketing? What channels? You know, like they don't understand how all these things actually need to be in alignment. So when you talk about, you know, some of these buckets, there's like, maybe four or five buckets that you look at all the time. I look at, you know, what's the brand awareness? Like, are they good at marketing? Are they, do they understand how to do that, how to tell their story? You know, is they, from a capitalization, do they have the right financial structure to, to whatever their ambitions are? Um, is it a, you know, kind of a sales channel thing? Like, are they actually approaching the right individuals? Um, is there, you know, something from an organizational, like uh, I call it like human capital? Do they have the right people there? Do they need to be doing those types of things? And usually those buckets, like, you see a lot of problems. And it's also, like, how those problems interact with each other's problems. So it's a lot of coming in there and saying, okay, here's where you're at. 
here's where you want to be. I know what most people know what their goal is. They're like, I want to, you know, sell my business. I want to reach $10 million. I want to whatever that is. And I go, okay, this is where you're at now. This is where you want to be. Here's all the things that you would ultimately need to think about if you do want to achieve that. Because yeah, it's great to say you want these like, you know, vanity metric goals, but like, do you actually know what it takes to get there? Do you actually <laughs> know what it, you know? And that's where I come in there and kind of put those pieces together and, and go in there. But to your point around like, do I have this like, you know, cookie cutter approach? No, when I go in, I'm totally agnostic. I go in there and go, let me get in there, understand what the business is about, understand what their constraints are, what they're good at, what they're not good at. And then I start to build out this plan based around all the tools in my tool belt. So it could be like, I'm going to use this tool, this tool, this tool in these types of uh, sequence. This, the next person I come in, even if they seem like they're competitors, like on face value, they're completely different behind, you know, the hood, yeah. under the hood. Like mm -hmm. I got to go in there with the totally different tools and I got to go in there and, to and, and basically do something that would be totally counterintuitive to the other person. But I have to go in there with like fresh eyes because at the end of the day, I'm successful if they're successful. I just need to get them to a goal. How I get them to that goal, I can't be romantic about it. Like I ultimately just have to be good at what I'm doing to help them get to where they're at. You know, if it's this tool or this strategy or whatever, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. For me, I just want to make sure that they're getting to that goal in the most efficient way possible. Yeah. Great questions, guys. Are, are, awesome. are you like uh, always working like sports and nutrition companies? Is that who you're mostly focused with, like your client base? It did start out that way, and I think that was partly because it was the easiest transition for Muscle Farm. Yeah. A lot of people knew me from that space, so it was easy for me to get some clients and things. Uh, but over time, as the industry has evolved, I have naturally kind of gravitated towards spaces that I thought would be most valuable. So, you know, it's about seven, eight years ago, I started to work on some traditional food and beverage brands that aren't in the space at all, that were like carbonated soft drinks, salty snacks like chips, things like that, yep. because at the they're the best at what they do. They're the best at that distribution model. They're the best at pricing. They're the best at like field sales, all that stuff. So I needed to understand as the industry evolved into energy drinks, protein bars, all that. They were going to use those same models, but they don't know how to do it. So, okay, yeah, I can learn with them, or I can learn from the best. Yep. So I actually would, I ate crow and worked, you know, for some of these clients and was like, hey, they don't really know me from anything, but I'll get in there and price it at a such a low level that I would learn. And then I would know over time, over these seven years, I'd make it up on the back end. I yep. knew I trusted my gut, and I think that's, a lot of what I've done over these years is like I'm always forward leaning. I'm always looking a couple years ahead and saying where where do I think things are going, and then if I'm not, I guess fully uh, capable or feeling like I'm going to be you know somebody that's going to be positioned to give value to the community that I want to, I need to go out and get that experience. So I'll go back and like eat shit for a while, and I'm and I'm comfortable keep doing that because I know that if I trust my gut and I've I've been consistently you know right over time or at least right more than wrong that like. I know over time it's going to make me money. Yep. At the beginning, I might lose my ass and my time or whatever, but in the long run, it's all going to kind of square up or whatever. So right now my mix is like a lot of the clients that I work with, they're not traditional uh, like caps, powders, pills, supplement brands anymore. Like, yeah, they might have some of those SKUs, but a lot of them are in food and beverage or they are trying to be in food and beverage because that's usually that big jump from, you know, there's usually a cap that you hit. And then when you want to play with the big boys, then you start yeah. to get into those things where you want to be in Kroger you want to be in Walmart, you want to be, and those, you know, retailers, they only have so much space for the traditional, you know, ones. And usually those are like the lowest kind of common denominator, cheapest things possible. Yep. But yet they got a whole merchandising rack of energy drinks. They got a whole merchandising rack of protein snacks and all that, you know, gut friendly this or whatever. So when you start to play into those bigger spaces, it's a completely different game, but I needed to learn that kind of shit over time. But it's been, um, it's been wild because that's a completely different world. But I like that because it's like, super complex and messy and, and, and like the the I always say like the, the the tougher the more I enjoy it you know it's one of those things where I, I just always have leaned into complex things I don't like the easy way out I'd rather be like that's how I I guess think about success is like I want to wake up and feel super you know uh, passionate about what I'm doing super um, you know inspired to do what I'm doing I feel challenged each day I can like explore my curiosity that day if like regardless of making money or like any of that, like I just want to make sure every day I wake up and if I can achieve that, all the other stuff's going to come with it. Like I feel like I'm going to trust my gut and just go with that. But it's a lot of just like every day I wake up and think of, okay, how am I going to attack this in the best way to make sure that I'm fulfilling those needs? Yeah. And if I fulfill those needs, then everything else will kind of fall into place.
I want to ask you about, so you obviously are looking kind of as the industry as a whole because you're, I mean, you worked with multiple different brands. It's like, <clears throat> obviously, we all was swimming in the Kool-Aid. I rolled the dice. I thought it was going to be a half a billion, real talk. Like, when I say that, like, I mean it to the core. Like, I thought that's where we were going. Didn't work out. Yeah. We had the deal to sell to Joe Fortunato. He gets removed, which a lot of people don't even know. And bang, there it goes, right? And I'm on to the next thing. And it's like, I think about that. And then I went the complete opposite because I was so tired of dealing with all those retailers, yeah. so thin of margins, and go back to really like probably what's most authentic to me anyway, yeah. which is direct to customer, old school type of stuff. You know, and it's like, it's such a big gap there's not a lot of people really playing both. It's like either one or the other. So it's like they're in Kroger's, like you're saying, or they're like, I mean, even messing with the bodybuilding.coms and that of the world. Like, it's messy now, bro. Yeah. Or they're just doing what, like, we do. Yeah. In, like, but I'm seeing very few that are just doing really what we're doing. Like, it's not, like, there's not a ton of just that I'm aware of. Of course, I'm not really out there looking yeah. for people to try to be like. So, but you know what I'm saying? Like, kind of give me, like, your perspective on it kind of got fragmented, and it's very different than it was, you know, even when we started this brand in 16. Yeah, I mean, I, I always kind of say this. It's the, uh, the bifurcation of the industry where there's... Like, What's that word? Bifurcation. Okay. It's like it's the separation of the two, like where there's two polar ends, where yeah. you kind of have the... I lived them both, I feel like. Yeah, <laughs> where you have um, you know these, these brands that are either you know going in there direct to consumer, trying to create a kind of a premium experience around the customer and really trying to be as like emotionally attached with cons customers, yep. or they're trying to go, you know, full on mass, you know, try to do all that type of stuff and like, play the margin game, play the, you know, the dollars game, and that's always kind of chasing things. In the middle, that's what's ended up washing out. And we talk I about, like, that. in the, you know, we're here in the Arnold, and, like, it used to be filled with a lot of those middle brands that were there, and they were surviving, they were doing well. Now they, it's tough to survive. Like, it's hard to justify cost. Like, they're hanging on. They're either zombie companies where they're about to be dead here soon, or they've either passed hands and now they're with some, zombie like, private equity firm yeah. or, you know, whatever. <laughs> they're all in these kind of things where – the middle is like where people don't want to be at. So there is like, you know, when they're playing where you guys are at, like either they decide one day, hey, I need to make the jump. And that's based around maybe they want to, you know, take some extra money. They, you know, they have some other ambitions or whatever that is. Or they build it to go the other way. Usually you don't have somebody that's trying to do all things. Yeah. Because it's just too tough now. It's, it's, there's so much noise. Like we talk about, you know, low barriers of entry in the industry. Like, it, you know, with a thousand, a couple thousand bucks, you can, create some products, fire up a Shopify, fire up your social media and start selling and looking like just any other brand. It's true. Now, some of them break through and they're great, but a lot of them just create a bunch of noise in the industry that just create competition, lower the you know price integrity of things, kind of just act like they're doing something, but it's just taking the attention from consumers. So all of that ends up hurting a lot of these brands that don't know where they're at because they're like, they're trying to reach everything. And then there's these other brands that are causing mess. And the only ones that are focused on the ends are the ones that are being successful. The ones that are trying to be all over the place, like they're just running in circles. They're never really kind of getting anywhere. And it's been this kind of like five to seven years, it's been strengthening over time where like, you got to pick a side, you got to know what you're yeah. doing. So like that first step is really a, a big understanding. And kind of what I was mentioning earlier when we're talking to, when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, where are you at with this? Like, what is that? Like, where are you at now? Where's your ambition? Like, how do you think of things? Because to your point, like you're building, you know, a profitable business, uh, a brick by brick business, you know, like you're treating each customer like they're special, like you care about them, like you want them to be successful. Now, that doesn't mean that there's any restriction on revenue. You could be, you know, 10, yeah. 50, 100, two, like, I mean, you think about a business like First Form, like yep. they did that, 20, you know, almost 20 years ago at this point, where like brick by brick, person by person, how do I get you from goal, uh, from what point A to point B? That's all I'm going to try to do. The more people I can get from point A to point B and successful in their health and wellness goals, the more that I'm going to be successful in my uh, business. And now they're a massive company. But at the beginning, it was just that simple thing. I'm going to build it one by one, one by one. And it was, and it was good. But it was really one of those things where uh, people got to know what they're doing. Because if they don't, like, I think that's what ends up getting in trouble, where they start to, like, try to be everything to everyone, and they end up being, like, nothing to no one. Ooh. You're dropping some balls. Right do we need a break? Good shit. <clears throat> All right, we're going to yeah. do a break. We'll do a commercial on All the right, way back. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. We'll be right back. What?
The Raw Table Podcast is brought to you by Max for Muscle in the new Pre Extreme. Extreme! Corey Gregory, please tell the people about the Pre Extreme. If you're ready to go to the next level, Extreme! Extreme! extreme. You gotta go 500 mix right to the dome. 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 Listen, it sold out so fast, we just got it back in stock. It's selling again. It's Don't miss it. Go to MaxSilverMuscle.com and get your Pre Extreme. Extreme! extreme. All right, back to the show. <laughs> I love that you guys just did like a complete live read um, commercial like that. Yeah, we it's, do it all the time. We do Very official. <laughs> yep. Well, yep. but you know what I was talking about was uh, having the reps like we've done. Are you no. good, Kyle? Yeah, we're good. We're good. good. Yeah, yeah we're don't good. worry about it. No, so having the reps that we get in the office constantly. So even if you're an intern right with us, I force you to do content. Mm. And you don't even have a choice. We just roll up on you and be like, all right, need an air guitar for this thing real quick. Like, So I think mm. what happens is the reps that everyone has had – he, Danny's like super awkward, but he's he, he, like yeah, super yeah. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> but but over time, he became small arms. I don't, Danny. I don't know if that's a call. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, so he, he became small arms. Danny, he's really owning it up. He's general of the arms army. Yeah, and now army. to do content on it, like it's like no big deal. Oh, so yeah. it's like it's it, it's just like yeah. the reps, bro. Yeah. To your point, he was like he's like I, I from afar. I swear you guys are building like your own like barstool fitness type of thing. We're, we're probably we're, a little we're less probably here. a little less degenerate, but yeah. yes, that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> that's a good yeah. way to put it. Yeah. Trace thinks he's maybe more degenerate, but I don't yeah. know. I'm, I'm degenerate. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'm right, Trace is a celebrity. So. Right, so, he is a celebrity. So we were just kind of <laughs> talking about how the whole the whole retail model to direct consumer in kind of supplements, how that's evolved. I'm very curious of like with these nutrition, like the food like packaging, yeah. like these snack type of things. Is there, like, going to be – are they going to evolve the opposite way where they're going to be done doing uh, mass retail and they are going to try to start to go into the direct consumer? Do you feel like that coming? Yeah, I mean, I think they've been trying to do that for a while. Like, some of these, I guess we talk about them conventional products. So if it's, like, Pringles or it's um, Oreos or whatever. So their package sizes are not conducive to online in the way that they would just, you know, do the same thing. They'd have yeah. to re kind of look at their what they call like price pack architecture where they have gotcha. to look at either some multi packs, they have to look at whatever. And they're able to do that, but you think about how you're normally buying those products, like you're doing it at three or four dollars a pop instead of buying a twelve pack of forty five or, or you know, yeah. fifty bucks or whatever that is. So you have tr they've tried that originally. I think what's helped them is a lot of these like last mile delivery or, or kind of um, if it's Instacarts or GoPuffs or, or those where basically they're taking these you know, uh, store locations, they're shopping for you and they're bringing it to you. Yeah. That's a little bit of a different e-commerce arm, um, yeah. but that's how they're kind of looking at it. They're not looking at it as like this pure play it, direct to, to um, home model because yeah. that's a little bit different where, um, it, you know, the price points don't work, the margins don't work. Usually the weights of the products and things just would be like unit economics wouldn't work. So they've tried it over time. Amazon helps a little bit, but over time it's really been, all the either store initiated like you know you pick up in the store and you order online or you order online yeah. and somebody comes and delivers it to your home that's like a third party or or, or something like that that's been where those traditional kind of um, you know products are at but saying that some of these like big food and beverage portfolios have went out and bought either functional food brands or functional beverage brands like brands that have value added products like energy drinks or protein bars or whatever because those unit economics are a little bit different mm -hmm. they actually can then enter into some of those markets and then kind of learn from them and kind of get some of that um, you know, kind of knowledge base or whatever. So as things change uh, over time and maybe things become cheaper to do the logistics and whatever, and we do drone delivery or we, we yeah. come up with teleportation or whatever the hell they kind of come up with next, like then they're ready for it. <laughs> you know, you just never know. I wonder what yeah. that shipping cost is because yeah. fuck, <laughs> the one we got now sucks. Yeah. That would be good. You know what's so cra uh, crazy is I've had so many people be like, gee, you need to do an energy drink. Gee, you need to do you know ready drink protein. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm shipping direct to customer. Yeah. It like does those model like I don't know anybody that it's worked for. Yeah, you you have to say, oh, I'm going to get in these stores. What people also don't realize is that that column in that store costs a fuckload yeah. of money. Yeah. So people don't understand that dynamic at all. That even in your mom and pop store, that Pepsi owns that column. Yep, and that Bang owns this column, and you ain't getting that nope. unless you're fucking spending some serious money. Yeah. It's it's a hard that 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 barrier to entry is yeah, very this, difficult yeah, compared slotting, to slotting now. fees are a real thing. Like yeah, I, can you explain slotting fees? I don't think anybody even knows what it is. Yeah, slotting fees. I mean, you have to think about as a retailer. Say you know Kroger, since we're in Ohio, you know Kroger is this massive 
you know, 3,000 store, multiple uh, banners across the country, you know, as they're uh, looking to merge with Albertsons, it becomes 5,000. But if you're 5,000 stores, you know your power. You know how much each inch of your store can turn within yep. each, like, merchandising section. So if you're a small brand and you come in to sell to the merchandisers and the uh, buyers and you go, I got the best thing out there, I got all these types of things, and they go, okay, well, what's on shelf now? We know what is turning at this per day. We have two days two cans a day at this or whatever, it's turning this amount of money. You're unproven. We don't know who the hell you are. We don't know if you're going to be successful or not. We don't know your – so to cut down on our risk, we're going to say here's the cost to get that on shelf. So we don't – regardless if you end up being successful or not, we actually are, are square. We're good. We made money on the slotting fee. And then if you're successful, then we get a double bang. We win-win. But at the end of the day – Double they, bang. Like they don't want to – Yeah. <laughs> yeah what's it, he used to have a uh, – shout-out to Jack Oak. Yeah. Uh, he's not going to listen to this. But yeah. – I'll shoot them uh, the clip of this one. He used to have that double shotgun, uh, what was that, like pre-workout or whatever? The VPX one. used to taste like shit, uh, but it worked like hell. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Hey, Jack posted one of Josh's videos I saw, which is pretty the dude from Bang. Jack Jack and I have have shared uh, a lot of great conversations together over time. I appreciate his his craziness. I think he's he's underappreciated for how well that that he can – you know, just do things that people uh, tell him he can't. I think he's been able to win, Facts. you know, off the off the back of his, like, tenacity and just kind of creativity on things. You know what I mean? Regardless it's of like his think fourth thing, and it went yeah. to 800 million. Yeah. I mean, fuck. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, <laughs> Literally 800 million. It's, it's insane, yeah. But going back to, like, yeah, the slotting fees is really for retailers to cut down on the risk of these new brands. I so mean, when that's Josh how is saying is, the yeah. turns, like, if, it's, if they're turning two cans a day, he's like, okay, we're guaranteed 16 sales a week. Yeah. And if you're going to come in, well, that's going to cost you fucking 200 grand. And then we're like, got no stores. And we go, uh, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that can even be for a mom and pop thing that has seven stores. Yeah, they, They'll I mean, be like, yo, the slotting fee is 25 racks for that. And you're like, yeah. what? I just want to get my energy drink in there. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a whole different Yeah, so when we deal. talked about like that bifurcation or whatever, and you go, okay, this is always a natural kind of progression is that, you know, somebody approaches somebody like Corey and say, hey, you should do energy drinks. You should do protein shakes or whatever. And you go, okay. I launch it online, you really, online is going to be a break even. You're not going to make money on it. But what you hope is that it creates demand, okay. it creates this like national kind of attention where people are like going out and actually going to the stores and talking to grocery managers, talking to like convenience store managers and saying, hey, why are you not stocking this? Why are you not doing that? That creates a little bit of like this like pool demand where then they go out and try to come and seek you. Then you have a little bit of a different conversation because no longer are they going to ask you for slotting fees, really. Yep. Usually then they're coming to you and saying, hey, we want you on, on, on shelf. So that's the really the hope. Sometimes that takes years. Sometimes it takes, like, months. It just depends on, like, if you caught something that people love or whatever. So there's really, like, there is a long game that happens with that online thing. But, like, going in, if you need to make money at it, you're not going to make money. It doesn't matter what you're selling because you're selling these 12-packs that weigh – you know, whatever, 20 pounds, that it ends up costing you just as much to ship it as it costs you to make it. So then all of a sudden you're at 30 bucks, you got to charge somebody 35. So you're barely making nothing by the time you got all your other kind of costs to cover you guys and cover everything else. It's like you're not making anything. You're just hoping and praying that you've hit on something that you have the ambitions to take it bigger. But if you don't have the ambitions to, to go after all those bigger accounts, like why go play in those pools? You know what I mean? Because you're just going to be making money and turning it right back around. You're never going to be really doing anything. For what ego or to create a product that maybe somebody you know marginally likes like there's a lot of other great energy drinks out there they don't need to necessarily do it um you have to believe that you have something that's going to be a little bit better or more exceptional than them or you just think that there's something that's going to be you know a hit if not you're kind of like eh, you know why do that because you can launch something else that makes you a lot more money a lot more margin um, and put that margin to play into marketing or whatever else you're building because you're not going to have anything left at the end of the day on these like big heavy products so, so with you being, like, essentially a professional problem solver, uh, <laughs> who are you kind of looking good. To, Who are you looking to in the industry, in or outside the industry, or what kind of resources do you kind of gravitate towards? Because you're obviously really well-spoken. You can articulate your thoughts really well. So what? how did you cultivate that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was – It's a fucking great yeah, question. No, that, was yeah, a, that was a really good sure. question, yeah. <laughs> like, how, how did the monster get created? Yeah. Um, I'm, I've been an obsessive person my whole life. Like, I'm one of those people that um, understands that the only way to get where I need to get is mastery. Like, every day I got to try to put in my work and Facts. do that. So, over time, I've just been so curious and try to get involved with so many things and try to ask the, the, the tough questions to try to, like, 
put that in my brain. Okay, this is how this person, you know, approached this one. Here's how they weren't successful or how they could have been successful. In my brain, I'm just building, like, pattern recognition. I'm trying to understand, like, these different things that could work in the future and, and how do you mash up things you've learned from the past and either even history. Like, I'm, I'm a big buff on history. I read a lot of, like, you know, entrepreneurship or, or like, uh, memoirs and things from these guys that have been around for, you know, that, that died 100 years ago or, or that, you know, took these businesses through these tough times or whatever. I'm trying to learn from them, even from outside the industry. It could be the auto industry. It could be from the tech industry or whatever because I'm trying to understand how these all things – because business is business at the end of the day. You're really trying to yeah. do – like, the vessel or the, or the product that we're trying to sell to them is different, but at the end of the day, most of the stuff is, is pretty similar. So you got to yeah. understand all that stuff. So I've just always been, like, a student and try to learn as much as I can. I'm, like, a big data nerd. I'm always, like, diving into these, like – huge reports of numbers that people would like drive them crazy but i just love yeah. like not only reading it but also trying to like contextualize it with what i already know and try to apply it and go okay this either supports what i think this is counter to what i think you know if it's counter why is it counter like and try to go down those kind of rabbit holes and try to figure that out but like if we're talking i've been doing this since you know i was in college like i was one of those kids that was probably learning much different than what the traditional kind of path was of, of even college so we're talking now at this point, like you know, almost 20 years of just putting this in. And over time, that's just uh, created this kind of monster that now yeah. um, I'm able to, you know, look at problems differently than most people. I'm able to quickly, you know, come up with plans or ideas that are different than other people. Um, but it's all based off of these decades of prior experience. And each day I wake up and go, you know, I don't, I don't know shit. Like one of the people joke all the time, I, I've mentioned this to a few people, uh, and they like, if you're a psychologist or a psychiatrist, this is probably like, the wrong thing to do. But like, regardless of how successful I've ever gotten, every morning I wake up and I look in the mirror and I go, you ain't shit. And it's yeah, my way to like, you. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's my way to check myself and go like, it doesn't matter what you've achieved. Today's a new day and you got to approach it in the same way. And you got to prove these people wrong and you got to keep doing it. You got to keep doing it. And over time, that's just how I've always been. So it doesn't matter if I was, you know, sleeping on an air mattress and, like, I felt like I hit it good because I made, you know, an extra thousand bucks and I thought I was killing it and I could buy drinks to all my friends in college. Or it was, like, you know, now where I'm, like, landing these big deals and I'm, like, on the top of the world. And then I look at myself and I go, no, you're still ain't shit. Like, you know, you, whatever you're going to do in 30 years from now is going to be nothing. Like, you, like yeah. it's going to be so yeah. much different. It's going to be so much bigger than what you're doing now. So check yourself you have no ego and just keep putting your you know nose to the grind and keep working yeah. so i know that's like a so, big thing for you yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, mean, I just keep picturing warren buffett sitting in his armchair reading like stock reports yeah <laughs> that's yeah. all i'm thinking about right now because that's yeah. basically what you're doing yeah my wife is she's like what like you i'm always like intense like at nighttime she's like what are you reading and like it's just me scrolling on my phone these like big dense reports on you know from an investment bank or it's like some big data like a scan data report and i'm like looking at the stuff and like she's like it's 10 o'clock at night, like shut off. And I'm like, I just, you I don't know how it. to shut off. Yeah. I just love it. I just like, Hey, when me. you feel like you hit it good, you feel like you hit it good. Yeah, you know right. what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we always hit yeah, it good, you, you know, know what I mean? Hey. <laughs> all right, hold on. Uh, I want to go back. So, uh, so you're reading all this stuff. So, like who, who are you reading about? What's like your top three, maybe your, you know, people you read about your favorite books. Like, yeah, what's that? Call. So I know there's always like recency bias. It's hard to like, you know, I, what, a, what I would just finish reading was, um, uh, a thing about the banana trade back in like the 1800s. Like, I read so, it. Yeah, what's that book called? So I it's like the uh, the fish that ate the whale, or the whale that ate the yeah, fish, or yeah, something yeah. like I that. that book. It's, okay. it's good. It's a it's a story about the United Fruit Company that ends up turning into I think Chiquita Banana. But yeah. like the, during this time, they own most of like Central America. Um, some of the early PR started because of them. So like you get to learn a lot about like the way they used propaganda mm -hmm. and how they were able to like turn over governments and like. There's another one I read about uh, basically a division of uh, craft. It was like Nabisco or whatever. They went through this, like, what they call a leverage buyout where, like, people came in from the stock market and was kind of buy And it was, like, this war that happened from between leadership and management and all this kind of stuff. Mm. Like, those are the kind of books that I read, these, like, kind of whatever. I also read a book about uh, recently. I, I can't remember the, again, titles are, like, totally escaping me. But the um, Lee Iacocca that used to be the longtime leader of Chrysler. Of Chrysler, yep. uh, just kind of his his memoir, or whatever, just kind of how he went through Evolved. the time of the auto industry and, and kind of dealt with all that kind of changing and stuff. Like those are the things that I like to read over time. I mean, I know, you know, there's those books like uh, you're big on like How to Win Friends and uh, you know yeah. those types of like I've read, you know, everything. You I'm know, what's so funny is I think 
I don't like that book actually. Yeah, That's yeah. Carne- Dale Carnegie. Yeah. I think he's. I don't even think he's fucking Andrew Carnegie's cousin. Yeah. You don't so think. I'm not a fan of that guy. <laughs> Yeah. I fuck so you with, don't think? Is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dale, I don't think he is. I don't think Dale he's related. Carnegie. I think he yeah. fucking utilized Carnegie's name to make himself more popular, which is kind of smart. smart. Yeah. 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 But actually, uh, How to Raise Your Own Salary is the one that I, I always push, which is Andrew yeah. Carnegie. But it's a Napoleon Hill book that I think is more, that's actually more beneficial than Think and Grow Rich because it's more of like an actual playbook for life. But people usually don't, one, people don't know about it, or they read Think and Grow Rich, and they're like, yeah. uh. So I try to tell people to read that yeah. one first, then read Think and Grow Rich. I also but read yes. um, recently, and this was uh, somebody in conversation. This happens a lot a lot of times, like where I'll be talking, and somebody goes, oh, have you read, like, you obviously read this book. And I'm like, what are you talking, I don't know that book is. And then they'll tell me the book, and then I'll go read it, and I'll go, shit, I'm actually like the walking, talking version of that. Yeah, I never yeah, knew that yeah, book yeah. existed. And that was the, um, the psychology of money I recently oh, yeah. read. And I think that's a good basic book. I just book read, that, read that a month ago. Yeah. For me, going that I went to school for accounting, I got my MBA with the focus in international finance, like numbers and money and all that, like I, they beat that shit into you from a prior life. Even though like I didn't learn that from my parents, my parents are complete opposites to me or whatever, but I just took a liking to that. But reading that book, I was like, damn, this is the shit they should be teaching you oh, yeah. if it's high school or college, like because there's such a like a misunderstanding of just how you think about money, how you utilize some of the vehicles, the financial vehicles and things. But people just have the wrong idea. And you have to understand how your brain thinks to actually um, either work against it to be like, hey, no, no, this is how we got to do it. Or at least, you know, like, why am I making these decisions so I could try to, like, yeah. you know, pivot or, or hedge myself or whatever that is. But um, that's a good one as well. But I'm all I kind of all over the book. I don't read any fiction books. I can't I can't yeah, wrap my head same. around the fantasy shit or whatever. Like I like the messiness of our world. Like I, people are like, I watch documentaries. It's fantasy enough. Do you watch bro. Star Wars though? No, I don't oh, watch any of that man. shit. Oh, like man. I don't like. Oh, I they're know, out. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but I literally, I don't either. I, like, I can't get, I, I, like, I can't get into like the network television because it's all yeah. this like fake kind of like, uh, you know, image of the world. And I'm like, no, our world is fucking a mess. Like, in, you know, embrace the mess, yeah. understand the chaos, and then find a way to to carve out a niche in that chaos to, to be successful. It's like, sure. why why does everybody want to escape it? And I think that's, nah, this is going to get See, us on I, a tangent. Maybe that's your I, way of turning I off. I was like, this is going to get a Star Wars. <laughs> All right, so from my like creative like branding perspective, I have I watch Star Wars and these Game of Thrones things, and I think about the whole process of like, how the hell did they make yeah. this Create it, yeah. yeah. yeah that's like, how did they make yeah. this? Because the teams behind that that are creating that are insane. Yeah. So watching that from that lens Yeah, pretty, I appreciate the, like, I think of that as like an artistic form. Yeah. And I appreciate yep. the the ability to do that in that medium. Um, I just tend to be one that's like, I don't know, I'm, I'm always locked in. I just, yeah. I don't know, that's whatever. But I do get the other side of it. And then we talk about like things like the metaverse or whatever, like, oh, that's never, like, think about people do want to, like escape the real world. Most people are like miserable as shit. Like I grew up in Youngstown. I know like they had the, the coal mining. Like yeah. most people, they're not necessarily living these like luxurious, exciting lifestyles. They're like trying to put food on the table. They're trying to like, you know, yeah. work this hard ass job to make sure they can, uh, you know, get these basic things for their family. And that's all they'll ever really seek out. Yeah. Um, so most people, when they have the opportunity to create this like new fancy world, it's like, they're probably going to think to do it. Yeah. You know, they're, they're probably, that's going to be pretty cool. You know, yeah. but I, I uh, at this point, I'm like, I'm pretty happy with the mess that the world is now. Uh, I know that sounds weird, but I, I just, I feel like the more chaos creates more opportunity. Um, so I, I, like I, I like when shit's going wrong because I'm looking at that as like consumer behaviors changing, um, people's desires are changing. All of a sudden, generational changes are happening. Maybe that's technology shifts, whatever. That's all to me. Like, yeah, I got to learn new shit, and I got to go back to like, you know, in this kind of eat shit kind of mode but it's also exciting because i realize it's on the other end it's going to be such a big opportunity as yeah. long as i embrace it and i don't think about it as like this challenge that i'm going to be you know all of a sudden like less successful it's like i have an abundance kind of growth mindset i think about it as like everything is going to be an opportunity to me as long as i look it through uh, kind of the right lens, that lens yeah yep. Fucking it's fire, shit, fireballing, yeah. bro. This is a banger. Yeah, yeah what sure. the, I mean, I think I need to just uh, move to the compound. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, I you mean, guys are gonna give me a you, show. You yeah. definitely should That's probably right. come out and hang out a little bit more though when you're in town for sure, Josh. I like this kind of talk. Like I, I feel like if anybody ever you know is watching any of my content, I always am trying to create the most high level, efficient, quick shit. So like it's ten minutes of like the most dense shit possible. Mm-hmm. But I don't get to show a lot of like my personality or whatever. And, yeah. and we're doing like these vlogs now where like I'm, I'm traveling around. I have Grant, my cameraman, and like people are like, man, 
You're actually like a little bit funny every once in a while. You actually are like, you can talk. <laughs> you're like, always oh, talking yeah. like numbers and yeah. spreadsheets. Like, There's not a lot of humor like, in that. You actually have some personality. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. okay. Like, I didn't realize that people wanted to see that. Yeah. I always was like, I know how much, you know, Corey's hour is worth. Like, he can make X amount of dollars. I got to give him at least that value in this 10 minutes because if I don't, I feel like I wasted this time and then yeah. I was not being appropriate in this kind of like community. So I always try to like limit that kind of shit. But these kind of things, I don't get to do them too often. When I do, I'm like, this is so much more fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, and then you see why how we can do those ad reads like off the off the cuff, right? Yeah. Trevor, you got anything else? Uh, I'm curious if there's like any industry that you haven't worked in yet that you want to work in. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I'm, I'm really big into now a lot of like what's happening with some of like the protein uh, technology or just in general like this idea of precision fermentation. So it's this idea that. You know, it's kind of stuff that was happening with, like, beer um, and, and just fermentation in general. But taking it and looking at how do we use um, artificial intelligence to create the same sequence of, like, a protein or a sweetener or whatever, but then use it through, like, this fermentation process. You can actually create the same thing, but with, you know, if it's um, uh, yeast or algae or, or it could be whatever it is. It's a plant-based material that you can kind of replace some of these other things. So, uh I, I find a lot of interest in that because I think that that's like the next, you know, Jetsons kind of thing where mm. we're going to look back and say, you know, all these kind of data centers, if you think about like Amazon has all these data centers, Google has all these data centers, but within these big data centers, they're doing all types of different things. They're going to be these big, huge like fermentation plants around that are going to build all these different kind of components. And I've been getting really big into it. It's still like in the first couple years, like a lot of the FDA um, and things haven't approved some of the stuff yet, so it's still early on, but it's, for me, a lot of that kind of uh, kind of tech side of where food's going, so food tech and just um, a lot of that's super interesting to me because I feel like, again, if I'm gonna be here 30 years, like that to me is gonna be where things go or, or where I feel things are gonna go and I need to be um, kind of up to date on some of that stuff. But early in when I was doing consulting, I, I had some clients that were, I was working with a, a company that did like autonomous vehicles out in mine sites out in like the middle of like nowhere, uh, Africa and uh, even in Arizona and Canada, they were doing like hard mining, like copper and, and gold. But they, you think about it, if you're out there in the middle of nowhere, but how do you run all of your equipment? Like you need Wi-Fi networks, you need all these types of things. Mm. So they'd actually have to like build up these like intense networks out in the middle of nowhere to run these like, you know, vehicles that are bigger than this convention center they'd run them off of like um, controllers because they're super dangerous to like go off the edge and you fall or whatever. So um, my always, my connection with Corey is like, I had to go get um, mine certified on like the safety side. So I had yeah. to go, I had to go underground <laughs> and above ground. I had to go through the whole course and do this whole thing. So I know like at least for two days, I knew what Corey like kind of lived that <laughs> lifestyle because I had to go down into a mine, a silver mine in, in uh, Colorado. and kind How of deep do, are the silver mines? Oh, I can't remember, but they're, it took a while. I was going to say, they're deeper than coal mines, it was, I'm pretty it sure. It was gnarly, but um, yeah, it was like when I started out because I was, you know, I was just trying to make it, you know, and I felt like I had such, um, you know, again, this is probably you know, mid 20 year old kid, late 20 year old kid, you know, I was thinking I was the baddest shit in the world. Like I could offer so much value to everybody. I was trying to seek out all those different things. And, so I, I had a couple of other industries that I worked in on projects before I got you know, kind of really hyper-focused. Now I know like I gotta be focused in on what I do because there's so much opportunity here. I mean, just the supplement industry as a whole in the US is $60 billion. Um, that's you know big, but also small when you think about like consumer Food, packaged goods yeah. as a whole, it's about a trillion dollar um, industry. And like, so there's so much opportunity that I could kind of carve out. And why try to go and seek out some of these other ones? But as the intersections happen, if it's tech or whatever, I start to get interested because I'm just such a curious person that I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get involved here. I gotta try to figure out how do I, you know, get some um, exposure to this or whatever. So right now, it's like I'm trying to seek out some of those companies that are doing these things and saying, hey, I just want to be involved. How, do, how can I get involved here? Because I gotta start to learn a little bit of this because if it is going to be what it, everybody thinks it's going to be, um, I, you know, I gotta have some exposure to it because everybody's gonna be playing catch up, and I need to be that guy that's like, okay, now that everybody wants to be putting this stuff in play. This is how you're going to do it. So what I keep hearing is very similar stuff. Willing to backtrack to get forward, right? Uh, always curious. Obviously, within your passion, it's like, and it's relentless. You can hear it in your tone of voice. You can hear it in the way that you answer the questions. I think I obviously mimic a similar thing. And it's like, I don't know who's ever preaching that it's that easy or that it, you know, it just is going to happen because you figure out some type of yeah. hack. It takes 
the type of intensity that you hear from Josh, that you hear from me, that you've heard from all these guys. It's every day. It's relentless. It's a pursuit. And then you maybe yeah. get a chance at something great one day, but you're not guaranteed it. But it takes all of that. And I think that sometimes that's a little lost with, yeah. you know, hard work works, bro. At the end of the day, yeah. like you got to be smart. You got to make calculated decisions. But, like, I like when guys that I've seen come up like that, that uh, I get a chance to talk to again because it sounded like that back then. Now it's an older version of it, and but it's it taken that entire time, yeah. and that's just what it is, bro. Yeah, I mean, like the instant gratification thing, and, and just seeing the, you know, fake it till you make it shit on social media, which I feel bad for like the younger generation because that is a lot of what they're seeing constantly. It's all the, like, it's all fake. It's all a joke. I mean, it's it's not the reality. The only cheat code that I know is what Corey just mentioned is that you just show up every day and put in your most optimal effort you can, even if you move the thing. Maximum know, effort. Yeah. You just, yeah. Think, <laughs> you just think of yeah, you just think about it as like if I could just get point zero zero one percent better every day, if you looked at accumulative compounding over time and you look back and go, Holy shit, I did a lot of good stuff and I put in the work because eventually somebody's gonna see that accumulation of work. Yeah. Even if you're not gonna get a you know, the, 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 the love or the, cl the clout or whatever that is, this is a long game. As long as, like, you know, everybody, we don't know when the next day, uh, what's going to happen. But I think if you're going to play that long game, you just need to just think about putting your nose to the grind and just doing what you need to do and sticking in that place because eventually somebody's going to give you uh, an opportunity. And then they're going to look at what you did before. If you put yourself in that position to take advantage of it, that's going to be that catapult to get you to wherever you need to do. But at the end of the day, you need to actually do the work to do the work. I mean, I think that... Like, anybody that looks at it go, well, there's got to be some other way to get there. Like, unless your parents came from some big money or whatever it is that you got lucky enough to do that, I mean, great, good for you. But, like, common working person, the only way to do it is, like, just bust your ass every day. Yeah. Where can everybody find you at, Josh? So uh, type me into the Google machine. Uh, Joshua Shaw, I think I'm on the first couple <laughs> pages. But, uh, yeah, I mean, most of my handles are Joshua Shaw or Joshua underscore Shaw. Um, I'm on YouTube. All, basically every social media at this point. YouTube's usually the long form one, but I'll, uh, I spend the most of the time on LinkedIn, which maybe people do or maybe they don't, but that's a killer per, uh, killer platform if nobody's spending a good amount of time on there, especially if you're kind of young in the in the game, that's a great place to kind of network or whatever. But um, yeah, just uh, I appreciate anybody that will spend a little bit of time listening to the dense ass shit that I create. It's not the same stuff as them, so <laughs> be prepared. Um, you know, make sure that you're not hyped up on uh, pre workout or whatever the the stuff you guys are reading. Pre extreme. Pre -extreme. Yeah, pre -extreme. <laughs> Don't do that because <laughs> I'm gonna let you down. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm definitely. You need to be, you need to be focused. But if you're too amped up, you're probably gonna be like, this guy just said 35 things that went over my head. I don't know what the hell's going on. So, yeah. but I appreciate anybody that would pay attention, and I appreciate you guys just like listening to me and everything. It was a lot of fun. I, I just, uh, I love doing these things. I wish I could do it more. I, I hope to uh, come to the compound one day and uh, shoot sure. the shit on all the different shows. I want to yeah. want you guys to see the breadth of what I could create. No, it was <laughs> great, man. It was great having <laughs> you on. I, I, cool. I got one last question. Uh, I think that people want to know, favorite arm exercise. You had to choose one to do for the rest of your life. Which one? Ooh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm old school, so I think it would just be like a – you know, like a straight barbell curl, like this. Uh, like, that's right. Cheat curl that's or regular? One. Yeah. I do a regular. Yeah, you're going, you're no, okay. Forehead. What are you doing? I'm not going to the forehead. No? I know Corey likes to go to the forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Um, I usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a. That was, no. like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was a pullback. Yeah. That was like a, that was a <laughs> fucking nerf hoop alley oop. Jeez. You know, but if anybody is. <laughs> Don't listen to me. We, you know, I got a, I got a hoodie on now, so you don't can't see this. But I, I, I'm, we're talking small arms. I might be small arms, Josh or something. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah, good. All right, this is a roundtable podcast. I'm your boy Corey G at Small Arms Danny at Trey Speed in the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. Glad to have you on the yeah, show, Josh. Yeah, we're out of here. Back brought to you by MaxEverMuscle.com. Peace. <laughs>